because she has this IT problem. Oh, well, we'll make do. Yeah. I'm looking she's at the... asking, She's asking me to tell you all that she's very disappointed, but she can't log in right now. Maybe until the end of the meeting, she'll be able to. Well, it'll be recorded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have we have Donald Bresnik in the audience. Isn't that great? Yeah, yes. I know yeah. some I know some guys that use this name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So maybe it's not him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know who's using it? Mm, I don't know exactly, but I I remember something look this very similar to that in the past. You know. Okay. Okay. Okay, everyone, everyone, so it's 12 o'clock, let's get started. Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfati, and unfortunately, Dr. Hilary Humans, who is always here with me moderating this session, she won't be able to join us for now. She's having an IT problem, so maybe later today. So anyways, our guest speakers uh, today are Dr. Rodrigo Aguiar, Dr. Erin Alea, um, Dr. Paulo Noronha, and Dr. Philip Tierman, who started the OCAD group uh, back in 2003, maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe he can tell us later. Um, so we are all very happy to kick off the year with the first session we focus on sports imaging and it's going to be like this. The speakers will present their cases and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during the presentation, the presentations, please put them in the chat box and at the end, the presenters, the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases almost every day, please consider registering on the OCAD website. I can assure you all that it will be very enriching as the website is full of cases and videos of lectures and sessions. A quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you all for your understanding and with that, I will kick off the session. We have the pleasure of having here today, Dr. Paulo Noronha. He's a board certified radiologist with expertise in MSK imaging. He earned his medical degree and completed his residency in diagnostic radiology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He completed a fellowship in general radiology at Instituto Dor de Ensino e Pesquisa, where he began to focus on MSK radiology which prompted him to further his studies with a visiting scholarship at the University of California, San Diego, under Dr. R Donald Resnick's supervision. He currently works at Regidor and Proeco, where he also leads the MSK subspecialty since 2020. Please, Paulo, take it away. You're muted. I think I can't hear you. You're not? Can you hear Paulo? I can't hear him. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, the, the mic switched. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Aline, for the kind introduction. So, uh, 
It's great to be among so many amazing people. And uh, I've learned so much from you and keep on learning. And so let's dive right into my case. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. And so let's right, dive right into it. So this case, uh, the clinical history of this patient, we have a 39 year old male with no previous medical history. He suffered a hyperextension injury to his big toe while playing soccer. And under physical examination, there was tenderness of their hallux sesamoids. An MRI was ordered, which showed these findings. I'm gonna just show the findings first without discussing them and then go over to the anatomy so that then we can discuss what's altered in this case. So here we have the images. We have this first finding. We have this finding. So this is medial, this is lateral. We have this finding. And on the coronal section in this slice, we have these findings shown with the blue arrows. So the patient suffered uh, the first MTPJ, the first metatarsophalangeal joint plantar injury, which is called a turf toe. Uh, here in Brazil, a lot of people don't know what turf means. Turf actually means grass, but it's a term that is often used to refer to the turf fields uh, originally in American football, but we, here in Brazil, it's more usually related to soccer. The term was coined in 1976 at West Virginia University, related to American football and, and attributed to flexible shoes on a hard artificial plane surface. This is an amazing article from 2020 uh, called High Resolution MRI of the First MTPJ uh, by Dr. Helena and colleagues. And I actually like to call this article ultra high resolution MRI of the of this joint because they used 11.7 Tesla MRI to acquire some of the images they show. So here we have uh, an anatomic section from a different article. And here we have the MRI image from this article. And here's a small meme from the office. I don't know if you, anyone watches this show. So Corpor needs to find out the difference between the differences between this picture and this picture. And then they're actually the same picture because we can see every anatomical detail in this 11 Tesla MRI image. So here we have a profile view of this first of the first MTPJ. Uh, we have the metatarsal head, the proximal phalanx, and here you're not in the helix sesamoid. Here we have the metatarsal sesamoidal ligament, and here we have the sesamo uh, the sesamoidal phalangeal ligament. And under that, we have the flexor hallucis longus tendon and dorsally, the extensor hallucis longus and brevis tendons. Now we're gonna ask this lady to see this image from below. And here's what we can see from below, which would be roughly an axial image. Here we have the proximal phalanx, metatarsal head, lateral and medial sesamoids. Between them, we have an intersesamoidal ligament. The stars are showing here the lateral and medial sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments. And between them, we have a fibrocartilaginous structure, which is the plantar plate proper. Further stabilizers of this, uh, of this joint are the AB ductor and AD ductor muscles and tendons. Here, the AB ductor tendon will insert on the lateral sesamoid joint caps on the medial sesamoid, sorry, joint capsule and proximal phalanx. The AD ductor, which has a transverse and oblique head, will insert on the lateral sesamoid joint capsule and proximal phalanx. The flexor hallucis brevis muscle has two tendons with a medial and a lateral head, which will insert respectively on the medial and lateral sesamoids. And below them, we have the flexor hallucis longus tendon, which passes right between the medial and lateral sesamoids at the region of the plantar plate. Here we have an anatomic section where the, uh, the proximal phalanx is deflected superiorly and the metatarsal head is deflected posteriorly. Here we can see, we can appreciate the lateral and medial sesamoids, the region of the intersesamoidal ligament, plantar plate proper, and the sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments. Now we're going to ask uh, Superman to do, use his x-ray vision. Nowadays, I think it would be much better if Superman had an MRI vision because that would mean less ionizing radiation every time she uses it and superior soft tissue contrast. And here we can see now a schematic and the MRI image of this article with the 11.7 Tesla ultra high resolution image showing on the coronal slice, dorsally the extensor tendons and plantarly, we have the lateral and medial sesamoids, intersesamoidal ligaments and from the metatarsal head, both medially and laterally, and laterally, we have the metatarsal sesamoidal ligaments. And here in the MRI image, we can appreciate all of these structures. 
And here more immediately, we can also see the adductor hallucis tendon. And here we have some more images from, the, from this uh, amazing 11 Tesla MRI. Here on an axial slice, we can see the sesamoids, lateral medial, intersesamoidal ligament, and the plantar plate proper. On the, on the sagittal slice, we can see the plantar plate proper, the flexor hallucis longus tendon gliding below it, and dorsally, the um, extensor tendons. On a more medial slice, we can see the medial sesamoid and the medial sesamoidal phalangeal ligament. Here on a coronal slice, we can see the medial and lateral sesamoids, flexor hallucis longus tendon, and here we have the adductor, abductor tendon, sorry, adductor tendon, abductor tendon inserting on the lateral sesamoid, which we blend then into the, with the lateral capsule and insert on the base of the pro proximal phalanx. On a more lateral slice, we can appreciate the lateral sesamoidal phalangeal ligament. These are more proximal slices. This is one, the one I'm going to go through. We can see uh, a more proximal part of the metatarsal head. Here we can better appreciate this part of the adductor tendon. And these, the, both of the heads, the oblique head and the transverse head of the abductor muscle and tendons. And here we have the flexor hallucis tendon passing me, uh, more in a more median place. So going back to our images, so this is our first finding. So we have a marrow edema at the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalanx of the hallux. Second finding, here we have the medial sesamoid, here we have the lateral sesamoid, and we can see there is disruption of the, plant, of the sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments. The medial sesamoidal phalangeal ligament has a gross discontinuity, but there is altered signal and irregularity of the lateral sesamoidal phalangeal ligament. We, we have a corona slice at the level of the sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments, which show a gross disruption of both of these ligaments. Uh, here we have a T1, a T2, and a DP fat set, uh, PD fat set weighted imaging, showing disruption of, the, of both of these ligaments with uh, surrounding inflammatory changes. Finally, a last finding of this, uh, of this joint, we had a questionable cortical irregularity at the plantar proximal phalanx. A complementary CT exam was ordered, which showed a small cortical avulsion at the, proper, at the plantar plate proper insertion at the base of the proximal phalanx. So this case is a classical turf toe, turf toe injury with a bone contusion at the dorsal proximal phalanx as shown by the green arrow, tearing of both lateral and medial sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments shown by the orange arrows and the cortical avulsion at the plantar plate proper insertion at the base of the proximal phalanx of the hallux. So the take home points, uh, this uh, first metatarsal phalangeal joint has a complex anatomy. This nomenclature is somewhat in inconsistent, but I think this article does a great job in describing and going through all, the, all those details. And familiarity with this anatomy enables precise description in the setting of injury, which enables optimal treat treatment choices. This is my bibliography. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paulo. Yes, indeed, the beautiful images from the article and beautiful case, thank you. So um, now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Philip Thierman. He's an internationally recognized expert in applications of MRI for evaluating orthopedic sports medicine and spine disorders. He's the co-author of three textbooks including MRI of the shoulder and diagnostic imaging orthopedics. He's also the, co the author uh, and co-author on over 60 original scientific articles published in the radiology and orthopedic literature. A native of Arkansas, Dr. Tim attended both college and medical school at the University of Arkansas. He did his radiology residency at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and did fellowship training in MRI at Cottage Community Magnetic Resonance Center in Santa Barbara and at San Francisco Mag MRI Center in San Francisco, where he continued to practice and was named medical director. Dr. Tillman was subsequently recruited 
for, uh, from SFMRC to the prestigious National Orthopedic Imaging Associates Group. Dr. Timmer is a widely sought lecturer and has spoken at over 50 international meetings and was the founder of the online MSK forum, OCAD, one case a day. Dr. Tierman is also a food and wine connoisseur and is the author of the popular book, The Wine and Food Lover's Diet, which was a James Bird uh, Award nominee. Please, Philip, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks so much for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm gonna try and figure out how to get my case up here. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, OCAD has really become a, um, an interesting place to be and a very uh, useful resource. It started out as a simple uh, email chain uh, back in the late 1990s when I was in San Francisco. And it's really morphed into what it is today, um, a, a teaching resource, a repository of cases, and also um, kind of a consultation service that um, anybody from around the world can uh, take advantage of. So that's a very, very exciting thing. And I, I wanna thank uh, the Radiological Society of Rio de Janeiro uh, and Aileen, especially for helping put this together and Hillary Humans, who is our first president of OCAD um, and she's just been fantastic. And a, a lot of OCAD today is because of her vision. So, <coughs> pardon me. What I wanna do for the next 10 minutes or so is, uh, is present um, an, a, a case that I found really interesting that, uh, that um, I saw just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm reading cases now teleradiologically from uh, uh, not only California, but um, the middle part of the country. And this case uh, came uh, from an indoor sports injury, which was um, uh, 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 basketball in, in, uh, in Tennessee. It snowed uh, in Tennessee just a few weeks ago. And so a lot of uh, indoor ac uh, sports activities were happening. happening. And this is the, um, the uh, history as I received it uh, when I opened up the case. It was a jamming injury of the fifth and what they said was pinky finger, which is the fifth finger in uh, basketball two weeks uh, prior. Uh, the, the patient has uh, an inability to extend the PIP joint. So it's kind of locked in flexion at the PIP joint. And so the orthopedist said, well, we've got an acute boutonnieres deformity and uh, the patient's got continued limited mobility. So I'm gonna show you the images uh, without, um, uh, pointing out the pathology so you can take a look at it. What we're doing, this is a T2 weighted sagittal image of the fifth finger of this 16 year old boy. And here's the radial aspect of the fifth finger. Here's the um, midline or close to midline. And here is- um, Philip, I can't see your presentation. I, I'm just seeing you. Okay, well, I tell you what. Let me uh, try to rectify that. Now, how are we doing? Great, thank you. <laughs> I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, I get the excuse of it's still early in the morning here. Um, <laughs> All right, well, 16-year-old uh, male jammed his finger in a basketball injury two weeks ago, can't extend the PIP joint, had what was described as an acute boutonnieres deformity with continued mobility. Here are the sagittal T2-weighted images. We're gonna go from the radial aspect to close to midline and just a little bit ulnar to the midline in this image right here, T2-weighted sagittal image. T1 weighted sagittal image uh, at the same locations, just radial midline of the fifth finger. So mesial portion of the fifth finger and just a little bit ulnar uh, to the uh, midline of the fifth finger. 
In the axial plane, we've got T1 weighted images showing proximal to the PIP joint. This is the PIP joint itself and uh, just a tiny bit distal to the uh, PIP, so uh, really in the same location. Proton density fat saturated um, axial image at the level of the uh, just proximal to the PIP joint and at the PIP joint itself. What I ask our technologist to do is to always include a normal finger anytime you're doing an image of a finger, just so you can have uh, something to look at that you know is normal and it hopefully will help uh, dissect out what is abnormal. So before we get into the findings and the pathology, I just wanna uh, review uh, briefly the pertinent anatomy of the finger. Um, on the extensor side, uh, we have the extensor tendon complex, which is the common extensor tendon with a central slip that inserts onto the base of the middle phalanx. We've got lateral slips that, that, can, that uh, co uh, join together to insert on the distal phalanx and that is the terminal slip. At the level of the MCP or the uh, metacarpal phalangeal ligament, we have the uh, extensor expansion, which helps us solidify the extensor mechanism at the MCP. Uh, and that includes the sagittal bands. At the PIP level, we have uh, something that is uh, a lot like the sagittal bands, but it's not um, uh, strictly called the sagittal bands and that's the extensor hood. On the flexor side of the fingers, we have um, the uh, flexor tendons and uh, the um, pulley system, which are made up of the annular pulleys and the cruciate pulleys. The uh, A1 annular pulley is just proximal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. The A2 um, annular pulley is uh, longer and it's at the base of the proximal phalanx. We've got cruciate, which means crossing, cruciate uh, C1, which is after A2, and then the A3 pulley, which is uh, pertinent in this case, uh, which is at the, uh, the um, palmar aspect or the volar aspect of the PIP joint. Now the findings in this case, we're gonna go from the radial aspect of the fifth finger, Notice that there is a defect of the extensor um, hood just uh, radial to the uh, common extensor tendon at the level of the PIP joint. Also notice that the flexor tendons at the level of the PIP joint are a little bit what are called bow, bow stringed. That's B-O-W-S-T-R-I-N-G-I-N-G. -I -I so bow stringing, uh, just like um, uh, a bow and arrow where you pull back, uh, the flexor tendons would be the bow and it's uh, not adherent to the undersurface. I'll show you a normal in just a few minutes. And you can see that the, the extensor tendon itself is actually intact. And along the ulnar aspect, it's, it's also intact. T1 weighted images show the same thing, a defect of the radial extensor hood analogous to the uh, sagittal band. We've got really pretty marked bowstringing of the flexor tendon complex and a lot of space beneath the distal aspect of the um, proximal phalanx. And then we have an intact um, ulnar extensor hood. In the axial plane proximal to the PIP, you have an intact extensor tendon. At the level of the PIP, there's a defect of the extensor hood with an intact central extensor tendon. And you've also got tearing of the pulley. Here is a normal pulley in the normal finger, the fourth finger that you can see in this, in this case. Uh, but if you look at the pulleys in the fifth finger, they're torn. At the level of the PIP, there's a defect of the extensor mechanism, just radial to the central slip of the tendon. And on this fat set sequence, you can see the same thing, the defect uh, with separation uh, of the, um, of the um, extensor mechanism. One thing I needed to point out is that the PIP joint is actually flexed. And so that's what they clinically saw 
was the um, boutonniere's deformity or flexion of the PIP joint. Now this was given an initial diagnosis of a jammed finger. Jammed finger is a fairly recent designation in the radiology literature anyway. And it's more really of a, of a clinical uh, uh, presentation and a clinical concept. And that is pretty much an axial load. Now, pure axial load is, is not that common, but it does occur. In, um, and that's what's termed a jammed finger. And it can have a varied appearance because different structures can be injured. The tendons, typically with a pure axial load, it's, um, it's uh, 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 either a subluxation or dislocation of one of the joints of the fingers, uh, injuring the um, collateral uh, ligaments. And, um, but uh, it's kind of rare uh, or unusual in my perception to have a pure axial load. And oftentimes there are torsion uh, type forces that, um, that are associated with the axial load. So jammed finger is kind of a loose designation and um, it can uh, also be accompanied by many other uh, things like in this case where we have a boutonniere's deformity and uh, we have a pulley injury. Here was um, a, a diagnosis uh, of a jammed finger that resulted in collateral ligament damage at the MCP joint. This is another patient. So in this case, uh, what we have as the, as the official diagnosis is pretty uh, complicated sounding was um, a radial extensor hood rupture and just radial to the extensor tendon with an A3 pulley tear resulting in an acute boutonniere's deformity and we also have flexor tendon bowstringing. The tendons themselves were um, actually intact. And so if you think about the mechanism that caused this, it uh, was a pretty complex mechanism. It had to be an impact on the, um, on the flexed PIP joint that caused forceful extension on the dorsal aspect. And that caused the eccentric rupture of the extensor hood. So just radial to the ex actual extensor tendon, and that allows the uh, boutonniere's uh, flexion deformity. And then the flexor tendons actually remained tight or taut uh, when the extension force was applied, causing the pulley rupture, just like um, full body weight or extension on the flex tendons, similar to rock climbing. So I'll just show you a, a quick example. Um, and let's talk about this for just a moment. What causes uh, flexion uh, deformities? It's typically something wrong with the extensor mechanism because if the extensor mechanism is not functioning, then, then the, uh, the joint in this case is a DIP, uh, won't be able to maintain extension and it will be either locked in flexion or um, at least um, passive flexion when there are no forces put across it. If it occurs at the DIP joint, it's known as a mallet finger. If it occurs at the PIP joint, it's known as a boutonniere's deformity. And in this case, it was a boutonniere's deformity because the extensor hood was ruptured and uh, we have loss of extension at the, at the PIP joint. Pulley injuries are on the other side of the finger, so on the flexor side, and uh, these have been uh, uh, graded clinically uh, from one through four, uh, grade one being the, the uh, least uh, severe injury. Uh, and that's known, it, that's seen as a pulley strain. Uh, grade two is a rupture of uh, A4, which is a more distal pulley. You can see in this diagram, or a partial tear of A2 or A3. And then a grade three rupture is um, ruptured A2 pulley or A3 pulley. Uh, and in this case, it can still be treated conservatively. Multiple pulley tears uh, require surgery. And how do the pulley uh, injuries come about? It's a marked extensor strain on flexed digits. And I found this kind of interesting, this fact, is that uh, there are different grips that are used in um, rock climbing, and you can... Uh, uh, um, analogous would be an analogous injury would be what we have in this case, 
where the patient must have been flexed when forceful extension was put on. And um, this type of grip called the crimp grip, which is really forceful flexion at the PIP joint. Um, I don't know why, why that's happening. Um, uh, actually uh, exerts a lot more force on the PIP joint than the simple distal grip that we see here. And so analogous to a fishing line, the, um, if you've got a lot of weight of, of a big fish, you're gonna put some strain on these flexor tendons and that can rupture actually um, the, the pulley. Here is a case of an A2 pulley injury. Notice the normal at the uh, proximal phalanx injury, uh, uh, pro proximal phalanx level. And here's the injured A2 pulley where we have bow stringing. And uh, for the last slide, since I think I'm a pretty much out of time, uh, we've got a normal pulley here, ruptured pulley. So the axial plane is very, very useful in showing a ruptured pulley. And uh, one can also see in the sagittal plane, bow stringing. And then what I was doing with one of our hand surger, surgeons was to actually try to image inflection. And when you've got a pulley injury, it actually accentuates the bowstring and, and shows it, um, I think, a little, bit, um, a little bit better. So the A2 pulley should be here, and you've got nice bowstringing right there. And uh, what the surgeon did was to go ahead and uh, uh, harvest the uh, palmaris longus uh, tendon and then do an A2 pulley repair surgically. So um, the last concept I'll uh, give you is um, other deformities that don't involve the pulleys, and that would be the Jersey finger, uh, which is a tear of the, um, uh, uh, the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, and it can retract all the way into the palm or, uh, or, or lesser. And I'll just uh, end it with this one image of a type one Jersey finger where you can actually see the tendon retracted all the way into the palm. So the purpose of uh, me showing this case was to show one complex injury that occurred in the fifth finger of a young 16 year old that came with a diagnosis of a jammed finger. And it turned out to be a more complex injury being both an extensor hood rupture allowing um, the acute boutonniere's deformity to be shown and also rupture of the A3 pulley, allowing the bowstringing that we saw on the MRI. So I wanna thank you very much for your attention and hopefully I didn't go too far over time and uh, I'll look forward to uh, uh, any questions that might come up at the end. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's our dog Buster, who's a rescue, uh, half coyote. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, now it's Dr. Erin Alea Turn. She's an assistant professor of radiology at NYU Langone Medical Center and a member of the NYU Langone Medical Center Division of MSK Radiology. Erin graduated from Pennsylvania State University in 2006 with a BS in biology and earned a medical degree in 2010 from NYU University School of Medicine. She completed an internship in medicine at Lenox Hill Hospital, New York in 2011. Dr. Alea completed residency in diagnostic radiology at Montefiore Medical Center, where she was elected and served as chief president. Following residency, she completed a one-year fellowship in diagnostic and interventional MSK radiology at NYU Langone Medical Center in 2016. Please, Erin, share your screen. Okay. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, let me just move. Okay. All right. Are you seeing my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. 
Uh, so I'm excited to be here today to present what I think is a very interesting uh, MSK sports case. Okay, so our patient is a 24 year old female who presented after a soccer buckling injury. So importantly, this patient is just 24 years old, but has had three prior ACL reconstructions. So on clinical exam, our surgeon was concerned for a possible uh, repeat ACL graft tear, meniscal pathology, and a possible posterolateral corner insufficiency. So we did the MRI and the MRI was diagnostic of a complete ACL graft rupture. And here you can see complete disruption of the proximal ACL graft fibers. Now, because of the complete ACL graft tear, the patient was therefore indicated for a revision ACL reconstruction. But this is not a straightforward revision ACL reconstruction. Remember, this patient has had three prior grafts and she's only 24 years old. So our surgeon wanted to optimize this patient to prevent any further graft tears by looking carefully at her anatomy, um, any intraarticular, extraarticular pathology, uh, and technical features that could be contributing for so many, to so many graft tears that this patient has had. So the preoperative imaging workup is going to be really important in patients like this. And so to kind of get into the mind of our surgeon, what they're thinking about when they're working up a revision ACL graft failure, you know, there could be technical contributions, uh, unrecognized injury to ligaments or the meniscus, and finally malalignment. I'm going to be going through uh, each of these. So from a technical standpoint, routine knee radiographs are going to be really important. And we can see here that the hardware uh, is in standard position. We have a nice position of the femoral interference screw and this cortical fixation button. The routine knee radiographs are great for looking at position of the tibial and femoral tunnel. So we see the tibial tunnel is entirely posterior to where Blumensatz line intersects the tibial plateau. That looks great. And then the femoral tunnel, what our surgeons use is what's known as the Bernard and Hertel quadrant, looking at the normal position of the ACL footprint at the level of the femoral attachment. It should be just uh, inferior to the most superior posterior square right here. And we can see here our femoral tunnel looks great. So for these patients, the surgeons often will also order a CT with 3D reconstruction. So we're looking at tunnel position, which we've already assessed and we've decided that it looks pretty good, but we also do these 3D reconstructions and we subtract out the medial femoral condyle. And here we're left with an image of the lateral femoral condyle. This is showing us the aperture of the femoral tunnel here, you see the interference screw. And I'm not seeing any uh, excessive widening uh, of either of the tunnels. If there is excessive tunnel widening, more than 14 millimeters, these patients may be indicated for a two-stage revision. The first stage where the tunnels are narrowed with bone graft and then uh, the graft is revised. So we've ruled out any technical feature that is contributing to her recurrent graft failure. Next, let's look at any unrecognized injury, uh, any ligament injury that could contribute to recurrent graft failure is most often going to be uh, posterolateral corner tear or insufficiency. This patient's posterolateral corner uh, looks perfect. So the po posterolateral corner is intact and it's not contributing to recurrent graft tear. So next, we look at the menisci. So on this MRI, the patient's menisci were read as normal. Our surgeons know now in any patient that has a native or ACL graft failure that intraoperatively, they're gonna look carefully for a ramp lesion or a tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus that occurs at the level of the meniscocapsular junction here we're seeing a vertical fluid-filled cleft at the level of the meniscocapsular junction. This is going to promote anterior tibial translation that can contribute uh, potentially to ACL graft failure. So this was seen in retrospect, uh, but it was not diagnosed at the time of MRI imaging. 
And then finally, we need to look at alignment that could be contributing to graft failure. So alignment, not only in the coronal plane, but also in the sagittal plane. So I don't know about all of you, but at our institution here at NYU, more and more our surgeons are or ordering these standing uh, lower extremity alignment films in patients with knee pain. What do I do? I determine uh, the mechanical access where it traverses uh, the tibia. And here I, I draw a line from the mid portion of the femoral head to the midline tibial plafond. I can see here that it's intersecting uh, the lateral tibial spine. So this patient's coronal plane alignment is fine. She has a slight physiologic valgus. What do our surgeons not want to see uh, in these patients? Varus alignment. And as you can see here depicted in this illustration, varus alignment is going to stress. It's going to pull on the proximal aspect of the native ACL or the graft potentially contributing to failure. It's also going to stress the posterior lateral corner structures. So this patient's coronal plane alignment was fine. So we're finally left with sagittal plane alignment. And here's a lateral view of the lower extremity. And we found, we found what could be contributing to this graft failure. She has an excessively increased posterior tibial sagittal slope. So this is something that we don't, it's not really widely discussed in our literature. So I created these illustrations. So here for your reference is the normal appearance of the tibial sagittal slope. And in contrast here is what excessive sagittal slope looks like. The posterior margin of the tibial plateau is tilted downward. And with an axial load that comes through the joint, uh, this is going to promote anterior tibial translation. It's going to allow the femoral condyles to slide posteriorly. And as you can imagine, this is going to stress uh, the ACL. So sagittal slope is something that needs to be measured when you can see ideally the entirety of the tibia or at least about 15 centimeters. And you can see here, uh, here's a measurement. You determine the anatomic axis. I draw a line at five and 15 centimeters down the shaft from the articular surface, get a 90 degree angle and measure the, the angle between that and the tibial plateau and it's about 14 degrees. And you can see here how it's much better appreciated when you can see more of the tibial shaft when compared to the same patient's routine lateral knee radiograph. And when we zoom in again, we can nicely see that excessive increased posterior tibial sagittal slope. Now you need a perfect lateral view, a perfect lateral view of the tibia where you can see both the concave medial plateau, the convex lateral plateau, superimposition of the fibula, not necessarily a perfect lateral view of the femoral condyles. So here, just to illustrate and to remind everyone, I don't measure this, the slope, uh, the sagittal slope on an MRI. We're not seeing enough of the tibial axis to really get a good, accurate measurement. Uh, but to just understand the biomechanics of this, just remember that the medial tibial plateau has a concave morphology, whereas the lateral tibial plateau has a convex morphology. And it's thought that that convexity along the lateral tibial plateau is going to permit the condyle to translate posteriorly. And that's why the lateral slope may be more important biomechanically. Now, these patients that have an altered slope and they have recurrent ACL failure, they often will have an abnormal medial and lateral slope. You can, you can measure either one. Uh, in the literature, you're going to see more, the medial slope is going to be reported because it's found to be more reproducible. And importantly, the medial slope is going to measure uh, several degrees more than the lateral slope. So this, this paper in AJSM uh, kind of uh, stresses the importance of the abnormal posterior tibial slope in promoting ACL graft failure. And they found that a medial posterior tibial slope of 12 degrees or more is gonna be the strongest predictor of repeat ACL injury. And because of this importance, uh, this excessive increased posterior sagittal slope is therefore going to be a possible indication for anterior closing wedge tibial osteotomy. So this is in the patients uh, who have repeat graft tears. 
and this uh, image just kind of illustrates the important of the, the importance of tibial sagittal slope. So the tibial sagittal slope here is going to be the hill. The femoral condyle, you can imagine, is the boulder. And the man here is the ACL. So if you have pathologically increased slope, a steep hill right here, an intact ACL is going to be able to uh, prevent the femoral condyle from translating posteriorly, but the ACL is still going to be stressed. If you have both a pathologically increased slope, a very steep hill, uh, and your ACL is out, the femoral condyle is going to be free to slide down the hill posteriorly. Um, you know, this force is only going to be alleviated by performing this anterior closing wedge osteotomy, making the hill less steep. So contraindications to the anterior closing wedge osteotomy are coronal plane malalignment. So if you have varus malalignment, for example, an anterior closing wedge osteotomy only addresses sagittal plane malalignment. When you do an anterior closing wedge osteotomy, you're going to have more posteriorly directed force of the tibia. So, you know, in a patient with post, uh, posterior cruciate insufficiency, this is not going to be a good surgical option. And uh, you're going to have more contact pressure in the patellofemoral compartment. So not a great choice in patients who have advanced patellofemoral compartment osteoarthritis. So this patient, due to her excessive sagittal slope, recurrent graft failure, she was indicated for a revision ACL reconstruction and an anterior closing wedge tibial osteotomy. So here is a diagnostic arthroscopy. You can see here, this is the lateral femoral intercondylar notch showing absence of ACL graft tissue. Again, confirming what we already knew from the MRI that this patient has a complete graft tear. Um, here is where the meniscal ramp lesion was diagnosed arthroscopically by our surgeon. Uh, it was probed, it was found to be unstable and it was subsequently fixed. And finally, here we have the anterior closing wedge osteotomy. So a wedge of bone is subtracted from the anterior tibia. That wedge is outlined here by the K wires. And here's the immediate uh, postoperative image after the anterior closing wedge osteotomy with metallic staple fixation. You can see here normalization of that sagittal slope. But it's even better depicted uh, when we look at the entirety of the tibial shaft. Pre-osteotomy, you can see that abnormal, exaggerated uh, slope. And here it's been normalized after the anterior closing wedge osteotomy. So I have to give credit to, to Mike Alea. Um, he's an excellent sports surgeon. He also happens to be my husband. But this is his, his case. This is more of a, a novel surgical technique. It's not often performed. Um, Mike has expertise in multi-leg knee injuries, complex uh, revision for grafts. So thank you guys, thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, please email me if, or if you have put any questions in the chat, if you have any further questions. Uh, and here's my uh, Twitter uh, profile. So thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. I do have a question, but I wait for the last speaker. <laughs> so next speaker <clears throat> is Rodrigo Aguiar, a very good friend of mine. Now it's your turn, Rodrigo. I'm introducing you before. So he's an adjunct professor of MSK radiology at the Federal University of Paraná, South Brazil. He completed the residency at Hospital das Clínicas at the Federal University of Paraná, and he did his MSK research fellowship at the university of California, San Diego. He's a practicing MSK radiologist at DAPI Clinic in Curitiba. Uh, and he's very involved in MSK radiology education, having presented at radiolo radiologic national and international conferences. He also authored several peer-reviewed scientific articles and co-authored book chapters. Please, Rodrigo, take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks, Aline, for your kind introduction. And it's going to be a, a great responsibility for me to, to wrap up this meeting today because all the other presentations, they were awesome. And they were 
excellent and so let's go let's go to let's go to the case let's just share my my screen okay can you see the the screen yes okay see. so today ladies and gentlemen we have a tennis case i'm going to present a case about this tennis player here his uh at the time of the injury, he was an 18 year, year old professional tennis player, and he was playing tennis for eight years, and his training routine was like six hours a day, and he presented with right elbow and distal arm pain for three weeks. So that is the that that's the, 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 the his clinical profile. And when we go to the images, uh, he went to us, uh, the uh, MRI of the elbow was performed. And first, when you have the, uh, a professional tennis player, an elite tennis player, we, 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 we think about some specific uh, pathologies and first ruling out the more common disease that we can find uh, nicely in this article here, for example. And the extensor tendons were okay. So the lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow is out. Uh, flexor tendons, tendons, media, it's also okay. So the medial epicondylitis is out. Uh, there's no medial epicondylitis. The ulnar collateral ligament, it's okay. A little bit thickening, but it's okay. There's no rupture, no T sign, nothing. Like there's no rupture here. So the unicolateral insufficiency is out. And continuing on, no posterior medial osteophyte on the axial plane. I couldn't see that either. So the valgus extension overload is out of, out of question. And also in the sagittal plane, you can see that the capitellum is okay. So osteochondritis, osteochondritis is seconds. It's all it's out in this case, but and there's almost always a but. Uh, we can see that the there is a high signal intensity on fluid sensitive sequences on the medullar bone of the distal humerus. Here we can see this high signal intensity uh, in the in the in the in, in the medullary bone, and we extended the exam to the arm. And when we did that, we found this high signal intensity on fluid sensitive sequences on this, the distal, the, the, the middle and the distal uh, diaphysis of the humerus, okay? So this is the T2, T2 uh, sequence with fat suppression showing this high signal intensity, this bone marrow uh, edema in the distal portion of the humerus. And here in the, uh, is the axial plane, T2, fat suppressed images and T1 fat suppressed images. And we can see a cortical thickening of the humerus, uh, linear periosteal reaction, and also some areas of intermediate, intermediate signal on T1, okay? So he's a professional tennis player and no signs of cortical break or soft tissue extension. And we, we uh, the diagnosis was a humoral stress reaction in an elite tense player, okay? And this is a condition that was kind of first described in 2006, this paper here, they described eight patients, eight elite athletes, tense players from the Australian Open 2002. They had pain in the dominant arm, uh, the same quantity, the same amount of male and female patients and they had bone marrow edema and periostitis. The same group, few, few months later, they also published this paper on the AJR. They use part of the, these patients and more, more, more four patients from the Australian Open of 2002 and 2003. And they they elaborate a little more, a little more about this uh, this air stress reaction of the distal humerus, and also in 2007, another group from Brazil they also described five patients, five uh, tennis players with this kind of alteration. And there is a good paper uh, from 2020 talking about doing a review about many lesions, the, 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 the lesions that can uh, compromise the upper limb 
of the tennis elite tennis player and they when they talk about this humor humor stress reaction and the players they have increasing pain when serving palpable pain over the distal humerus and a positive humerus squeeze test uh medial lateral uh palpable squeeze test and an anterior posterior uh is a squeeze test positive squeeze test uh, and they could find that the pain it's a little bit higher than the the elbow they go to the elbow this this pain they go to the elbow but also it goes to the distal third of the arm and if you if, when we took uh at that at that time when we took a look at the axial image we could see this small dot here in the in the cortical bone Okay, and the doubt was it if it could be a osteoid, osteomosteoid, okay, uh, osteoid osteoma. And, you know, uh, did I mention that the patient, the, the father of the patient, uh, he's a doctor or he was a doctor and not just that, he's also an orthopedic surgeon. So no pressure uh, on this case. So we did a uh, CT of the, of the arm, of the humerus, and we could see the, the thickening of the cortical bone. This is a vascular channel. And we could see a small, a small area of lucency here. And in the axial plane, we can see a small, a incomplete fracture of the, of, the cortical, of the cortical bone here in this area. So this was a case of a humorous stress reaction and an incomplete stress fracture in an elite tennis player. And after six weeks of resting, he returned gradually to his training routine, doing re he he rehabilitation and correcting his uh, kinetic emotion. And he had no more complaints on the follow-up. So it was a humorous stress reaction with a small and incomplete stress fracture in an elite te tennis player. Uh, the only case that I that I found uh, showing a stress fracture in the humerus in a, in a tennis player is this one from eight, uh, 1985, showing on the on the on the CT uh, this line of fracture right here. So that was the only report on the literature that I found that I found about that. And what's the cause? What caused this the, the, this stress reaction? in the humerus or uh, who are you going to blame? I like more the second question, who, who are you going to blame? And blame the serve. The problem is the serve. It's the most energy demanding motion. It compri comp uh, comprises uh, 45 to 60% of all strokes in a tennis match. The kinetic chain mo motion must be perfect and it can be affected by previous conditions like shoulder disease or elbow disease. So the, 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 the athlete doesn't have the, 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 this perfect kinetic chain motion. So it can, it can overload the humerus and for example, or improper biomechanics, for example, improper knee flexion, uh, mechanical loads transmitted to the shoulder and elbow increases by 17 to 23% if you have an improper knee flexion during the serve. So you have to, the, the tennis player, he has, or she has to have a, 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 a perfect uh, motion in order to, to avoid this kind of injuries. And here, uh, what happens is this, uh, the elbow in this phase here, during the, the cooking, the late cooking and the acceleration phase, the elbow and the shoulder, they go together in external rotation as a team. And here in the late cooking, in the beginning of the acceleration phase, the elbow continues, continue going, going on, on external rotation in valgus, uh, going backwards. And the shoulder starts to change in direct direction, go to internal rotation, okay? To move forward with the arm. And it is in this right, in this moment here, that's the, when this high humeral torsional stress, it, that's when it happens. And I recorded a, a video here, trying to explain that. So here's like the shoulder, the elbow, the humerus here. Uh, so first we have this wind up and early cooking phase of the serve. 
and oh, the shoulder and elbow, they are an external rotation. And after that, the late cooking phase here, look, the shoulder starts to internal rotate and it starts before the elbow. The elbow, it's still in external rotation going backward in, in valgus. And look, and that's the moment when the, these high torsional forces are applied to the humerus. And you can see here uh, in this, that my tower serving as the humerus showing this distortional forces. So that's when distortional forces, they are transmitted to the humerus, especially to the, to the middle and to the end part of the humerus and uh, it can cause the stress reactions. So it, we can see that in the different sports when the, the athlete has to throw the ball, the ball, for example. So we can see that in cricket, uh, cricket in softball, um, uh, American football, baseball, dodgeball. And it's not just a thing that occurs with tennis player, but actually uh, with other sports, for example, softball, baseball, uh, dodgeball, you can have some, it can, it can evolve, it can evolve, evolve to fracture. Uh, here, look, it's the same mechanism uh, when, in the throwing athlete. The difference here is that, that in the throwing sports, the, 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 mecha, the mechanism is a little bit more violent because when you are throwing something, you, you doesn't have to think about a ball in like the tennis play. He has to think to mind the ball, to, to, to reach the ball and to, uh, and so he has to control more the movement. But we, in throwing sports, the, the, the movement is more violent and it can cause fractures, spiral fractures, of the humerus, and this is the thrower fracture. Okay, so it can happen also like with soldiers. Uh, for example, in this paper for 1971, uh, from soldiers from throwing hand grenades. So not just in sports, but also in war. But sometimes sports and war they are the same thing. And just to put the icing on the cake, or in Brazil, a cereja no bolo. Uh, we also, uh, this patient also performed an x-ray, and in the x-ray, we can see that the right humerus, it's much more developed than the left humerus. That's the, his hand, uh, dominant hand, that was the hand that the, we, we could find the fracture, the the fracture and look the bone asymmetry here. And there is a, the, it's a, it, we like, it's something that's very well described. The upper limb muscle and bone asymmetries and bone adaptation in tennis players, especially in elite young youth tennis players. And that, the, and there is a catch name for that, for this, this asymmetry of the limbs. And that's the King Kong arm. So the, the, the King, King Kong arm, is the nickname for the overdevelopment of the dominant arm and shoulder in tennis player. You see, it's also known as the unilateral muscular hypertrophy, but that's the boring term. King Kong, King Kong arm, it's, it's much nicer. And there's another uh, definition about the King Kong arm that goes with this one too. And that's it for this presentation. I just well, uh, presented an, an unusual condition. It, but I think that's underestimated, this condition. We have to keep look on that. And uh, we don't find this condition in some of the good articles. I reviewed many papers, uh, good papers, and they don't talk about that, just few ones. And we also used this condition to understand the mechanism of lesion. In, uh, in the tennis and also uh, how we can extrapolate that for the other, other sports, the throwing sports. And that's it for this presentation. And I'm open for questions too. Thank you all. <laughs> what a great session today. Fantastic case and discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, for now, I don't see any questions here. But um, I do have a question to Erin. Um, there are a few studies on how to measure tibial uh, sagittal slope on MRI. 
but are these already validated? Uh, I mean, can we reliably use it? Because I saw you, your surgeons ask for radiographs and in order to measure it. So how is it done in NYU and so yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are some studies that have uh, measured the sagittal slope on MRI, but if you look at the images in those studies, they include a good portion of the tibial shaft uh, and um, at least our, our routine knee protocol barely goes beyond the proximal metaphysis. So the, a reading on our knee MRI would be pretty inaccurate. That's why um, it's really, you need to see at least, they say 15 centimeters of the tibia to get an accurate measurement, ideally the entirety of the tibial shaft. So, so there have been studies on MRI, but really the radiographs are gonna be the best measure. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a question here for the first case, for Paulo's case, it's from Matt's iPad. So hi, I'm Dr. Gasset. In the first case, are there any anxieties of the LHET, Paulo? Um, that would be the, I, I'm not sure about the... LHET? The hallucis extends, longest hallucis extensor maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, I'm gonna just take a quick look over it again. There was a, a lot of inflammatory changes around the MTPJ. So I, I the, the longest, just let me open the case again. I had already closed it. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're referring, I, I think it was more probably uh, a bone contusion and not an anthocytis due to the traumatic uh, nature of the, of the injury. I'm just gonna take a quick look at, oh, at it again. Uh, can I, sh should I share my screen again? Yes. If I'm just gonna share this real quick. Yeah. So um, here actually we have the extensor uh, hallucis longus tendon inserting at the base of the distal phalanx. And here we don't see a lot of change. And here is actually inserting proximally is the extensor uh, hallucis brevis tendon. And here we attributed this to a, a bone bruise or a bone contusion after the hyperflexion injury. So I wouldn't call this anxiety due to the traumatic nature of the case we're seeing here. Okay. Thank you, Paulo. Um... This is from Pablo um, Brentifo. Good morning for Dr. Tillman. Um, which coil do you use for performing MRI of a flexed finger? Um, do you use measurement criteria for diagnosing partial pulley tears? And is it possible to see flexion deformities in cases of partial tears of central or terminal slips? Thanks. Let me share my screen here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Those are good questions. Um, which coil do you use for, for performing MRI of a flexed finger? Uh, what That case that I showed was um, done at our local center here and we use the knee coil. Um, you, I think there's uh, there are different choices you can use. If you can use a, uh, a wrist coil and, and get the finger in there, and flex it, um, uh, that would be great for a small field of view, but I, I don't really think that's possible. So we use the knee coil, head coil would also work. Um, do you use measurement criteria for diagnosing partial pulley tears? Uh, I don't really, um, I just, uh, let me see if I can get the case back up. Uh, for uh, partial uh, pulley tears, um, uh, you might not have uh, much bowstringing, so um, I, I don't uh, really, I just eyeball it. For full thickness pulley tears, it has been, um, Recording in progress. it has been uh, uh, described in the literature. In this case right here, um, you can see the, the measurement um, was uh, taken out uh, compared to the, uh, to the normal. And um, so, uh, 
And then finally, the last question, I'm gonna read it again. Um, is it possible to see flexion deformities in cases of partial tears of the central or terminal uh, slips? I would imagine that it would be, I mean, I don't know the direct answer to that question, but depending upon how much of the, the, um, uh, the tendon is actually torn, I, I imagine that if it's greater than 50%, you probably would have some element of flexion deformity. It might be uh, not straight on flexion. It might be uh, a little um, oblique, but um, that's, that's my, my thought. Okay, thank you. There's one more question from the audience. Um, are there any relation between FT sagittal slope with patella alta for Erin? Uh, that's a good question. So that is a potential complication of removing an anterior wedge of bone from the tibia. You can get resultant patella alta. So that's a possible post-operative complication. Okay. Um, Rodrigo, have you seen this uh, lesion you showed us in other sports here in Brazil? Because like the, sport, the sports you showed there are not common here. Uh, the only one which is common here is tennis. Uh, America, American uh, football, we don't see here a lot. None of the sports you showed actually just tennis. So do you see it often? No, I mean, no. Often, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about like the, the overhead sports here in Brazil. We have like volleyball, uh, water polo, tennis, but they are all more controlled. So we, we don't see much of these lesions here. So this was a nice, that this was a nice case because we are not so aware of all this throwing mechanism that uh, the countries that have like sports with the, the, the throwing, with throw, throwing athletes, it's like, uh, it's like soccer for us, right? <laughs> there are some lesions in soccer that we just, we almost, uh, when we were born, we already know what are the lesions now. And that's something that we don't have about the, 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 the throwing, uh, the, the throwing sports, the throwing mechanism is something that we, we actually have to, to, to speed up to, to, to catch the, the references and to, to, to understand better what, what, what's happening. And so here in Brazil, uh, just more tennis. Yes, for sure. Um, thank God we don't have many granite throwers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, it's like uh, I, I couldn't put I, I didn't put that on the slide, but uh, the like this, the the baseball, it's violent and uh, throwing grenades, it's violent and desperate sometimes. So it's a it's a step further. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, one more question for you, Rodrigo. Um, in cases of stress fracture hemorrhages, do you always ask for CT in order to rule out oste osteoid osteoma? No, no, we we just we just did that in this case because uh, first uh, his father he was he's a orthopedic surgeon and he's a clo close friend of us and we saw that small dot on, on the T two and we were a little worried about that but uh, so that's why we did the CT. Otherwise, if we like, we will treat like we will let the the patient rest for for some time and see what happens. But probably uh, we will uh, in in other cases we will not do that. We want we wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. It was nice for the presentation, but. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I, I don't see any other questions here. Everybody saying what a, what a wonderful presentation. Um, congratulations for all cases. So, okay, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today and thank you speakers. It was excellent, one of the best sessions I've uh, moderated. And I want to, I'm looking forward for the next session, which will be held 
on February 25th, uh, with focus on rheumatology. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.